So, uh, welcome to Data Council's first meetup in KL. Uh, m my name is Ayas, uh, that's Alex, this is Hazik. The three of us are your points of contact whenever it comes to anything Data Council. So if you like tonight's session, uh, maybe you want to support us for future ones, the three of us, you, you come talk to us and we'll sort you out. So this is what we have in store for you all tonight. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit about what Data Council is. Then we'll move on to a nice segment I'm kind of looking forward to. Uh, we'll tell you more about it later. <laughs> it's not test-driven development. <laughs> right? Uh, and then we'll move on to the talks. And finally, we have a job pitch session where uh, companies who are hiring, you guys can pitch your company, or uh, people who are looking for a job, you can pitch yourself, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. So before that, let's start off with a little bit of gratitude. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors tonight. So our event sponsor tonight is Fave. Uh, this is their office. Uh, we moved here about two and a half months. And I'd like to invite Zumi, the CTO of Fave, uh, to give you guys a little bit of a uh, welcome. Yeah. Right, how many minutes do I have to say something? <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, much more responsive. Yeah, yeah, yeah much more. Yeah, you gotta get that. This one doesn't work? No, it oh, works. Oh, oh. You have to connect both. Oh, yeah, for, yeah, the, for the, the video. Screen. Oh, okay, right. So I have to be careful what I say. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is this is a quick one to say welcome to everyone um, to FIP. And I'll probably want to share uh, one, two, three, probably three stories. One, one minute each <laughs> uh, related to data that probably not related to each other. So normally when someone uh, asks me uh, and uh, what do I think about data or how I start to think about data, I would always say, you know, it's not about the data, it's about the question that you ask, right? Yeah, I can see like, people are shaking their head. Yeah. And I like this answer because it makes me look smart and it looks like I know what I'm doing. But today, we were solving these uh, performance issues uh, with our applications, right? Uh, yes, we have some questions need to be answered which we answered, and then we fixed those. But then I was like, you know, wandering around through, through the apps that we use to look at all our metrics and so on. I don't really have a question to ask, right? So looking around and saying, hey, these uh, metrics look a bit weird. Why is it supposed to be this way? And then, then only we like uh, going uh, deeper and then realize that, okay, we actually could fix this, right? Yeah, so, so there's no look. Now I can like change my mind. I wouldn't only say that, hey, it's so only start with a question. Sometimes just stumbling around randomly through the data sets also could solve a problem. So that's story number one. Story number two, uh, recently my wife watched this uh, a Netflix documentary. It's called The Great Hack, right? Yeah. yeah, so about a Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, and all that stuff. And then she asked me, uh, what do you think about this? Why do you feel about your data being used by, by companies uh, for their own benefit? And then I look at her and say, uh, I work at Faith, um, <laughs> which is a consumer <laughs> marketing, <laughs> consumer application. But uh, to be honest, the, the answer that I give her is people been using the data this way since pretty much forever, since the starting of marketing even, right? It's just now we become more efficient about it. Uh, if you talk about the usage of data illegally, okay, probably, no, I don't want that, right? But use uh, data to understand you and to, to, to serve you better. And the way I see it, I've been doing this for the longest time, and it's pretty much around. So that's my answer to her. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is, fuck, I forgot already. Like, a, <laughs> what? GCP. <Just, yeah>, <laughs> <laughs> oh really? <laughs> oh man. Uh, Hashin, man, I had a very like awesome story just now, but now I forgot about it. So I guess we just call it. You know, this is just a tribute to the awesome story. Uh, it's not really that awesome story. I uh, guess to say that recently when we start hiring uh, people, when we talk about, we've been interviewing you know, a day in and day out, right? People coming in and out, but we never really sit down and use that data set to, to our own advantage, right? Like knowing 
which interviewer is the, the best or better individual, right? Those that consistently getting, uh, getting it right. Because when you talk about uh, hiring data, as much as you have can be like objectively asking questions or specifically looking for a specific skill set and whatnot, a lot of things when it comes to hiring is all about gut feel, right? And then I realized that looking just now, just right here, why we never use this data to find which engineers are actually a better interviewer who have a better gut feel on uh, finding the right people, right? I don't know what actually the data we're tracking, but I do know that you know when someone say yes, do we hire them or not, right? If you're consistently getting it right, then probably you have that good gut feel. It's always about taking a gamble on someone. It's always about hiring someone for their for their potential, not so much about who they are right now, right? And it's hard to actually guess that potential. So it really just builds based on your your gut feel, right? So a lot of data probably won't help you there. It's really sometimes it's just you know gut feel just telling me this. So Hopefully we can learn a lot tonight from, from the speakers. And thank you for these few minutes of, uh, you know, of fame and cursing on, on live uh, streaming. Uh, <laughs> all right, thanks guys. Yes, having said that, we're always hiring. I'm sure it's implied. <laughs> And we have Baz who sponsored our food for tonight. Yeah. And we have Cam, who's a data engineer in Baz. So, yeah. Data engineer lead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's up, guys? Oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Oh. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Why, why just now the fave one? You guys so loud, but now. Bus, then like less, less loud. Okay. So, I'm here in front of you guys today because uh, Buzz is hiring. <laughs> uh, my name is Pam. I'm the data engineering lead of the of Buzz, I guess. So, um, <laughs> um, most of my job mainly is about like mainly driving data strategy within the company and just doing anything the company wants me to do, which is a lot of things, <laughs> by the way. Is that why you're holding a cleaver? <laughs> yes, so um, that is me asking people to do things for me <laughs> in a nice way, like, like suggestive, like, but I mean, like they shouldn't make the wrong decision, right? Um, so yeah, um, the company is hiring. We're hiring data scientists, data engineers of all levels, as long as like you're interested to learn, interested to grow with us, we're gonna invest in you. And yeah, we're just basically a very cool company <laughs> with very cool people like me. So like just yeah, uh, after the event, you guys can like just contact us to like say uh, hi, say hi to me, say hi to. My CTO is over there, Ash. I, we're like the biggest height difference in the company. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah. Um, uh, also, just a side note, like the company is one of the very few companies that I found within Malaysia that actually heavily invest in their employees. So like, I think very few companies really care about their employees' growth and like trying to build a really world-class team. And I think Buzz is one of them. So, yes, yeah, you want to, yeah, sure. Um, we put in a lot of time and effort to like make sure you grow as whatever you want to in your career. So like, for example, for me, I'm actually like, I started studying economics. Like I don't have any background in data science, data engineering, data whatever, data anything. I can't code when I first started. I finished my degree, finished my master's, and I didn't do anything about tech stuff. But like, I really wanted to get into the industry and learn about what all this fast changing technology is. And after speaking to Vaz, they invested heavily into me and like, I guess I am where I am now because of them. So, so yeah guys, if you guys wanna like, grow and learn and like, be good together, just like, talk to me, talk to anyone like, 
email me at pam at vaz.ai. And like, that's my Twitter. You can follow me. You don't need to follow my company, but you can follow me. <laughs> <laughs> like, so yeah, uh, I guess that's all. You guys have any questions? The company is cool or nice. <laughs> uh, I'll, I invite people for drinks every week or so. Just saying, like, I know the best places in KL. I can fight anybody here on that. <laughs> and like, yeah. OK, I guess that's all. OK, thanks, guys. <laughs>
you can come talk to either one of us, Alex, Hazik, or I. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hear you out. Okay, so the next segment we have is heavily influenced by, if you've all been to Dev, uh, what do you call DevOps Malaysia, they have a segment called Buzz Corner. And we sort of uh, renamed it sort of adeptly for our, con for our meetup called the data dump. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the data dump, what is data dump? It's just a simple five to 10 minute session where we'll share with you cool things that we think you should know about. Maybe in the past month, maybe in the past few months. Could be data breaches, could be anything. So yeah, the data dump. And let's start off with a very simple one. Uh, a lot of people ask uh, how to get started in data science. Or uh, how do you build teams in, the, uh, in your data, in your companies? And usually, uh, it, the, you can find articles everywhere. But what we found, or what we found was, Sequoia's data, data science blog is pretty much one of the best when it comes to overviews of how to get your data science team up and running. They tell you all the way from evolution of a product, right? They start from the foundations. They tell you what to track, how to track. And they tell you a lot of high-level metrics to uh, drive your team. And this is just seven articles. In this table content, there's like 27 articles, right? So yeah, this is the first pretty interesting one uh, you guys can check out. And that's high level. If you go, if you want to know your day-to-day -day operations, if you all heard of GitLab, GitLab is uh, one of the companies that are fully remote. What is fully remote? They don't really have an office, uh, and their employees are all over the world. So GitLab have a data handbook. They also have an engineering handbook, which is pretty good, but a data handbook is super awesome. Check out that, that quick table of content. They'll tell you everything they do from scratch, from the way they plan their everyday meetings, from the way how to contact them, OKRs, data pipelines, and this is awesome. Like right? Every stage of their uh, data pipeline and how they collect, extract, which data sources, what timing, everything is in this blog. So yeah, uh, later on we'll be sharing the slides so you can check out the links. It's all in the link to, links here, right? So yeah, these two references is my end I want to share. I, I think these ones, uh, right. So basically we compiled a bunch of these things and we'll share one by one. We have six all together and after that we'll send you the links, right? If you all heard the news, uh, over the past month, uh, a lot of uh, BI tools were being acquired. Uh, Tableau being one by Salesforce, probably the biggest deal, one for 15 billion. And uh, a lot of BI tools are being consolidated. SciSense and Periscope, Look, Google buys Looker. Google basically buys everything nowadays for in the data realm, and they keep on pulling people to their uh, platform just with the data side of things. So yeah, this is another cool link. You can guys you can check it out. Whoever likes Harvard Business Review, uh, now they have Harvard Data Science Review. Another thing you can bookmark in your uh, <laughs> bookmark thing and maybe not check out. But yeah, this is a business review. I read it every now and then. It's super good articles and uh, very insightful. Now you'll have a data science review. Data breaches. I think Ashrik has like a... Yeah. yeah. So uh, I had a link to this one. Basically, uh, there's two major breaches that happened in the past two months. And uh, first one is Capital One. If you guys, if any of you guys uh, are from like US or Korea, basically it's like a huge uh, data breach. And this one is particularly interesting because it was by an insider. So it's an actual hack. Most of the time data breaches are because of people just misconfigure stuff. So it's not like someone actually hacking stuff. Uh, in this case, it was actually one of their employees that uh, brought the data out and you know posted it online on her GitHub, if I'm correct. Yeah. <laughs> So um, it's been taken down from GitHub now, but basically like one of the things to take away from this, I think is basically you need to have better data audit and policy and you know, like data trails basically. Uh, the other thing is Monzo, and this one's a very interesting one because um, Monzo, it, it's kind of not really a data breach in a sense. Basically, um, their pin numbers for Monzo were exposed in internal logs and were exposed to internal engineers. So it's a data breach. They consider a data breach and they told people it was a data breach. But the only people who could really see the PIN numbers were the 100 engineers that they hired that they're actually Monzo employees. But I also thought it was interesting because I think a lot of us, when we're engineering stuff, we, don't, we, you know, we print out emails, we print out 
phone numbers, we print out everything in the logs, right? And uh, later on, when we push it to production, those logs then sh get shipped into some logging system. And now you have phone numbers, emails, and you know a lot of other PII, maybe IC numbers in your production logging, which is not a good thing, right? So uh, always sanitize your logs, right? Remove, if possible, have like configuration that removes the console logs or whatever logging that you have when you deploy to production. Uh, and you can also install like kind of libraries that specifically start out PII as well from your logs. So yeah, just two things that I thought was very interesting. Uh, second thing that I added to this link is Meltano. So uh, I don't know who here has heard of uh, Meltano? No? Uh, what about GitLab? Who here has heard of GitLab slash uses GitLab? Okay. So Meltano is a project out of the company that runs GitLab. And what is really cool about it is it's kind of similar to GitLab in that it's basically an open source collection of tools that work well together for your whole data science workflow. So if you see, they, what they basically do there is they went, you know, like um, Meltano is an acronym for Model, Extract, Load, Transform, Analyze, Notebook, and Orchestrate. And they have their preferred stack there, which you can actually download and install and run on your own instance. And they have comparables at the bottom there. So for example, um, DBT, which will be talked about in a bit, is a uh, comparable to like Pentaho DI or Aluma. And Meltano UI, which is their dashboarding, is equivalent to UI and stuff like that. And the cool thing about this is it's the same as GitLab. The strategy is the same as GitLab in that they basically make it open source, make it free for people to use, and in the idea that you can use a standards-based approach to then set up your data infrastructure. So thanks, Ash. So um, what exactly is DBT? I think it's a really cool tool. So DBT basically stands for Data Build Tool. It's a really cool open source uh, CLI tool that basically allows your data analysts and data engineers to transform data inside your warehouses much more effectively. So uh, basically, DBT handles the, the T in ELT, which is the transformation. So as you can see, this is like the main, oh, oh, oh. Yep, so basically you can see it handles all of the transformations uh, inside your data warehouse. So it has two components, a compiler and a runner. So what's I think an interesting feature that it has is that uh, you can actually run your SQL transformations with Jinja, which is a templating language. So you can actually make your SQL queries uh, much more powerful, reusable, and ultimately more maintainable. Um, it also comes with a package manager, so your data analyst can actually share your transformations with others. And uh, basically, you can think of it as uh, creating a programming environment for your databases. So definitely really cool. As you can see, it's a snapshot, uh, uh, this GIF here of, of the, uh, how we use the tool. So I think it's definitely worth a check out. Uh, for the next one, is something a little bit different. So um, we've all heard of, of SaaS companies, which is software as a service. But have we heard of DAS, or data as a service? So I thought this is a really cool article, which is by um, Oren Hoffman who is the CEO of uh, uh, SafeGraph, who is actually, uh, is actually a DAS company. So they are a provider of point of interest, uh, data, business listings, uh, store visitor insights. So the, I guess this, this article is specifically tailored at uh, data-oriented startup entrepreneurs. Um, so it talks about the differences between like compute, uh, SaaS, or, and, and DAS companies, and talks about the three main pillars of data businesses which is all about data acquisition, which you source your data from, data transformation, and data delivery, because it's all about uh, providing data to your, your end customers in the most uh, uh, clean and usable way possible. Um, he also discusses like, uh, all like the, the key success factors for these kind of companies and economics of such businesses, where uh, they say that uh, the, the thing about DAS companies, which is quite interesting, is that it's not a winner-take-all market, but it's a winner-takes-most market. So there's actually lots of opportunity for multiple DAS companies. Um, and also uh, from, at first it may look like uh, it takes a lot of money to start up a DAS company, at least from an accounting perspective. But over time, uh, I, these kind of companies actually have a compounding competitive advantage and they're extremely profitable. So definitely something worth to check out. And do check out their appendix section where they actually go over different uh, data themes such as uh, what kind of uh, DAS companies can you start up? Like for example, uh, 
could be uh, companies focus on people-based data, uh, it could be on locations, products, and so on. So uh, definitely check it out. Uh, yep. All right, that's like the last article that we wanted to share. Uh, and then the final piece is uh, I want to talk about a little bit of the local communities in Malaysia. We are not the only one. Uh, there are two links there that are super helpful. You can check out basically all the events that happen around KL. And uh, yeah, one is a scraper, the other one is community curated, which is Engineers My. Yeah, you can check out those two. Oh yeah, so right before we go to the talks, uh, I want to remind you guys, uh, we have a feedback form. I tell you guys now and tell you guys later because we are super, we want feedback from you guys so we can make the sessions better. And uh, if ever you want the slides, we'll post them in Meetup. For now, we're only using meetup.com because we want to standardize with the other communities in different countries. So yeah, meetup.com and that feedback form is just bit.ly data council KL. Okay, so kept you guys waiting long enough. The talks are now here. Uh, first up, we have Naz. Uh, yeah, he's going to be talking about breaking into data science and his hurdles, challenges, and lessons. Everybody, give it up for Naz. <laughs> Okay. All right. Can I put this here? Speaker here. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Nas. You can call me Nas, lah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about breaking into data science hurdle, challenges, and lessons. So. Oh, same side. Right, okay, so I have a disclaimer slide. Okay, I have a disclaimer slide. So, please, all views expressed today, tonight, and whenever you see me are on my own, and do not represent opinions of any entity whatsoever that I work in. <laughs> Two, do not construe my views as legal or financial advice. <laughs> Three, due to the nature of my work, there are some things that I wish not to disclose, and I wish you respect that. So, yeah, please don't prod too much. Eh? All right, so once the disclaimer is done, you can call me Nas. Hi, my name is Nas again. I work as a data scientist, not data scientist. I work in the data science unit in Bandungara, Malaysia for the past two years. I go to a lot of hackathons. Um, hackathons is like my thing. Um, I'm supposed to get my number 17 hackathon, but never had one yet this year. Maybe soon in the future. Um, I like to find out tech terms and try to like, translate it in Malay. Uh, okay, cool, cool, cool trivia. Do you, anyone knows what's AI in Malay? Anyone want to say? Anyone want to? Kecerdasan buatan. Correct. <laughs> correct. Correct. What else? Uh, what's a, what's another fun one? Uh, neural networks. Neural networks. Anyone want to try neural networks in Malay? Tak. <laughs> Rangkaian neural. Big data, big data in Malay. <laughs> I once translated a memo, a memo in Malay, and I have like data besar, and I looked through. No, it's actually data raya. Data raya, big data in Malay is data raya. So whenever you see like public government events, it's data raya. Okay, all right. Hari <laughs> raya. Right, okay, um, and I also like to lift heavy things, I power lift. So yeah, let's move on. So what I'm going to talk about today is three things. I want to talk about my experience breaking into data science. I want to talk about the challenges I face through my journey and how I manage those challenges. And some of the lesson learned and things I feel that works for me. Can you guys hear clearly if I do like this? Can you guys hear? Okay. Can or? Can. Can. Can you? Can. All right. Okay. Just want to be clear. All right. So my background. I studied at the University of Michigan uh, in the US. Go blue! Woo! Woo! All right. So that's my Michigan people there. Um, so yeah. So I got sent uh, on a scholarship to study econ. Two years in, I realized I do not want to do econ. So I shifted and pivoted and took another major in computer science. So after that, I have to serve my scholarship bond uh, back in Bangangara. And 
back then they were starting a data science unit. And my old manager came to me and said, hey, I know you can code. Do you want to join the data science unit? And I was like, yes, I love to code. So I will join the data science unit. <laughs> and I knew back then it was going to be a start of something new. <laughs> hey. But really, when I first started in this unit, right, I had this question. So I was like, what is data science really? Anyone want to answer that? No, because no one knows what data science is. Like, it can be, it could mean a lot of things. Traditionally, it's this, right? You've seen this Venn diagram before. It's the intersection between domain expertise, math and stats knowledge, and computing skills. But then some people define it like this. Okay, cool. Then you go deeper and deeper into LinkedIn and you find like something like this. So what is data science really? And honestly, like, I, this is not my first time giving talks about data science. Like, internally, I also give out talks about like, data science. And I never had a good definition of it. Until one day, I found a definition given by Casey Korskov, the chief decision scientist in Google. Thank you. Data science is the discipline of making data useful. Simple, succinct, and really, that's all it is to it. You can use the most chunky neural network, the most complicated models. But if you're not making your data useful, it's not data science. You can do data science Excel, it's fine. But why lah? Like, like, why do you want to do that to yourself lah? Um, yeah. However, because of this definition, right, you have the first hurdle of data science. Data science as a field is huge. We are talking about multiple disciplines here. You have your math, you have your stats, you have your computer science, you have your DevOps thing somehow thrown in. And this is not including the business you are in. Let's say you're doing data science in consumer business. You also have to know that field as well. You're doing it in finance. You have to know finance as well. It's huge. So where do you start? Back then, my first instinct when I say, I need to start somewhere. Where did I go? I went to the home of data science. Okay, go. In 2017, when I came back, the first thing I, when I Googled data science, how to learn data science, everyone told me, go to Kaggle, read some, read some kernels, join some competition, and I did. I did the Titanic data set, I Boston house pricing data set, Iris data set, I did them all. But see, one thing about Kaggle, right? It's good, it's good. If you want to know like the new models, how do you do, you know, Changi stacking, model assembling, it's good. See how other people approach a problem. But unfortunately, reality is often disappointing. In the real world, it's not a Kaggle competition. Yes, it will help. Yes, you will learn a lot in Kaggle, but doing data science in the real world is not doing a Kaggle competition. And I learned it the hard way. My first data science project was a failure because I put too much time in things that I shouldn't put time in. Now, which brings to the second, second hurdle I want to talk to you about. The real world. <laughs> Welcome to the real world. See, I started in data science as a fresh grad. I worked somewhere in my part-time, my internship, yes. But my first real job is in this unit. And I am a part of a pioneering team. I do not have a data science manager. It's sink or swim, bro, sink or swim. And this is basically what I, when I got my first real world data set, it's vicious. It's crazy. And just to, just to read the room, just to read the room. Anyone here uh, aspiring data scientist, data engineer? Aspiring? Aspiring? Anyone who is in this field, who are data scientists, data engineers? Can I have a hand? All right, so you guys know how funky things can be, right? Very funky one. And this is the reality. <laughs> That's a lot of data wrangling. Like, I kid you not. Uh, let me show you something, like one of my experience doing data wrangling and data cleaning. Uh, you know like people, like isi borang, right? Isi borang. 
why would you use an O for a zero? When you type, why do you use an O rather than a zero? How do you process that? Like, what, why? And sometimes, like, they give me, oh, this is a TXT file. And randomly, there will be, like, these long strings of question marks. Randomly. And it's like, wait, how, how do I process this? Like, so, yeah, a lot of data wrangling. And Kaggle is like, oh, yeah, this is, like, the data set. Go do your Keras neural network and stuff like that. But it doesn't work in the real world. And that's the lesson I learned the hard way. I didn't clean my data, like, that's why the project is a failure. Like, so. <laughs> no. The second thing I want to highlight about the real world. More often than not, the problem is not defined. Especially you're working in a team that is new, without like data science leadership, you will be working, let's say, with business users, business departments, right? And then they will be like, oh, solve my problem. Okay. What's your problem? Uh, not that sure. So it's like, can you use data science for that? Then you do not know what to do. So, Kaggle is very straightforward. Oh, do this, minimize the metric, blah, 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 blah. In the real world, even the metrics, you have to, you have to like justify why you're using metric. Yeah, the metric you choose. Why you use RMSE over MAE? Why? Justify that. And when talking about justification, the next challenge is the biggest challenge in the real world. You are not working alone. Like it or not, you, data science is meant to support the business. And business means other departments, other teams, other businesses. So I work in corporate, right? So I have this wonderful department called IT. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have to do IT. Uh, <laughs> but, IT department is very strict. For good reason, because we don't want data leakages and whatnot. But like, you know, I still have my job to do. So usually I get like, oh, you cannot install this. It's risky, because it's open source, it's risky. Then you have your management. They went to this one conference in Hong Kong that they came back, and it's like, let's do AI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yo, yo, oh, you guys can know also. Ah. Ah. Solidarity, man, solidarity. But yeah, so yeah, AI, blockchain, IoT. And then now, apparently, apparently, there's something called deep tech now. Have you any, any one of you heard deep tech? Yeah, it's getting increasingly, people say, oh, we need to do deep tech. What the hell is deep tech? <laughs> okay, my money, in 2020, MDEC is going to have a big tech, deep tech conference. My money. <laughs> All right, sorry, I am deck. Uh. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, hey, my views are my own, okay? Okay, so, next. Next user is the business users. People you are expected to deliver value for. And like I said earlier, they also do not know what problem they want to solve. And like I said, this is what I struggle the most in my two years working in data science. And that's the reality. Now, how do you handle it? You gotta communicate, man. You gotta communicate. We are engineers, we are technical people. We know like, let the data speak. Let the numbers speak. But honestly, at the end of the day, we are the one who speak. IT do not want you to install something. Talk to them, what is their concern? Can we compromise? Management say, let's do AI. Talk to them, why AI is not really what we need to do. Business users say, oh, I do not know what's my problem. Talk to them, let's say, okay, so your process is A. B, C, correct, right? Now, if you want to do it better, how do we want to do it better? You got to communicate. Like it or not, in data science, you are, you can, data speaks, but data speaks through you. Then your model, then your numbers. So that's one thing I want to hone in. Now, next is hurdle number three. And I'm going to be very real, very, very real right here. You're going to lose yourself, man. We are in tech. We are in data. And we are in data science that spans multiple, dis multiple disciplines. But the expectation that you're always given is that you have to be an expert in all three of this. 
that shit is overwhelming. And as someone who has to learn in the job, sometimes it just breaks you. Because how can you compete with people with a PhD? How can you compete like, you know, with your other peers? Imposter syndrome is something that when I talk to my peers also, they have to deal every day because the world's moving so fast. And you think that, oh, I need to like stay up late to learn linear algebra. I have to like work over weekends to learn this framework. Honestly, guys, it's stressful. But, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Take your time. Do your best. You're going to be okay. We all going to be okay, guys. So please do not feel pressure. Take your time. And honestly, we are a community. Whatever you're dealing with, Alin algebra is hard. It's fine. This field is hard. Just do not lose that spark in you that made you come into the field in the first place. So yeah. Now, that's all the hurdles. Let's go to lessons. The first lessons I, I, I learned um, while going through my journey is that fundamentals are very important. You know why? With a strong fundamentals, you can learn anything you want within that field. Without a strong math fundamentals, forget deep learning. I mean, yes, anyone can add Keras layers, right? But when, that, when those layers fail, how do you want to handle it? When someone asks, why do you use random forest over logistic regression? You need to know those fundamentals as well. So four things I want to outline if for those aspiring people out there who want to get into data science. Four things I feel very important to have to have. A programming language that you can communicate with with. So yes, Julia is great. But a lot more people using R and Python. So maybe when it first started, try R and Python first, then go to like Julia or Scala or something like that. Command lines, like it or not. You gotta be familiar with command lines, man. Drag and drop tools are great, but when push comes to shove, command lines. Data wrangling and cleaning, like I mentioned before. You need to know how to clean and wrangle data. Best way to do it, do you know the plane crash data set? Anyone has played the plane, plane crash data set? It's a very dirty data set. That data set is good for practice, for data wrangling and cleaning. So take notes, plain trash data sets, just Google online. And finally, quantitative analysis. You may not know linear algebra, and that's okay. But you need to know how to analyze the data sets quantitatively. Your distributions, your descriptive statistics, your t-tests at least. You need to know that. Right? For soft skills, prob critical thinking is very important because you need to frame the prob problem. Blah, problem. Scope it and know how to solve it. Even though you don't have the technical knowledge to solve it, at least you know the steps. Because then you can work with other, work other people. Hey, I may not know random forest, but I know you do. So here's my step to the problem. Can you help me with this? Very important. Second, communication of your findings. Business do not care about your RMSE. They only care on what those numbers mean. You got to communicate of that to any audience level. You, you can communicate to your fellow data scientists, you can communicate to your manager, technical or not technical, you can also communicate to management. That is the skill that is very important and you should hone that, fundamentally. Third, visualizing data and making good slides. Really, really know how to make slides. Slides are life, PowerPoint is B. Now, for hard skills, Coursera Data Quest is the things I, I those MOOCs I use, pretty useful. For soft skill, it's just practice. Practice, do it, and most importantly, seek feedback and reflect on it. Okay? Now, second lesson, learn from others who tread the path. So this is important for context, because usually when you start in data science, you only know what MOOCs teach you, what textbook teach you. But how do you want to like accelerate what to do in the real world? One thing that I really, really like to do is read technical blogs from other companies. My personal favorite, Airbnb, Gojek, and Netflix. 
really really good the way they outline oh we have this problem this is how we solve it and this is the conclusion try to you know reading diet is great so technical blocks highly recommend it second podcast my personal favorite is data frame they invite a lot of like um, heavy hitters in data science like Hilary Mason uh, Chris Alban Vicky Boykis heavy hitters in data science they speak in data frame very good Meetups are great. Meetups such as this one. We're gonna have events quite often, right? Once a month, right? Ah, yes. Once a month. So I hope to see you next time. Because meetups are great because we are in, all in this together, right? I feel lonely when I first join the pioneering team because I do not know what who to talk with. I have problems cleaning data. Oh, you have problems cleaning data too. Yay, now we are best friends. <laughs> so things like that, things like that are priceless. So do come to me now, mingle around, who knows, you, that's maybe your next future teammate, or like you can join my team, I join your team, you know. Uh, <laughs> and next up is Twitter. Twitter is underrated for insights. Yes, Twitter is all where all the memes are, where all people debate politics and whatnot, but Twitter also is also good for small nuggets of insights. Personally, I recommend Chris Alban, Vicky Boykis, uh, DJ Petto. They tweet really, really good stuff. Now, lesson three. Have fun doing this. Data science, yo, when people say data science, it's like, uh, science is boring, then data, uh, double boring. You don't have to, you don't have, it doesn't have to be boring. It can be fun. See, like, I like to make gag projects for fun. Um, I like memes. I like data science memes. So these are like some of like the fun memes I have found in my collection. Yeah, I'm weird. But it's fun. So do have fun, do have fun, do chillax a bit. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be serious. Um, but yeah, so those are the three lessons I learned. Three hurdles and three lessons. And thank you very much. That's my Twitter. That's my Twitter. You can follow me. I tweet data stuff 50% of the time. The other 50% is me being Sandu. Uh, but yeah, any any questions? hiring. Yes, my team is hiring. My team, the data science unit, is hiring. We are looking for people. I cannot say much about it, but please do talk, talk to me personally, because this is live stream, so talk to me personally after this. So yeah, I'm here, until 11, hopefully. So yeah, my team is hiring. Yes, gentlemen at the back, do you have a mic for q and I can shout. You can shout. I can hear you loud and clear, so go ahead. Mm -hmm. and how oh, stakeholder management, very, very corporate work, love it. <laughs> so stakeholder management, here's one thing I, I kind of like learn about stakeholder management. Personally, I feel that is um, useful. Usually, you meet stakeholders over meetings, right? It's very good to always recap your meetings and outline clearly on what they need to do and what you need to do, very clearly. And make sure you set a deadline for that, right? And when they say, it's like, oh, let's do AI. Do not talk down to them. Yes, you can talk down to them in your head. But when you actually say it, do not talk down. Say, yes, it is something that you see. However, Acknowledge their viewpoint is very important. People that get defensive, if you say, oh, cannot, 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 they get defensive, so, oh, why cannot, why cannot, why cannot, right? Accept their view. Then say, however, we need to do step A, B, C first. Then maybe we can explore. Don't say, then maybe we can. Say, maybe we can explore doing AI. You don't want to dig yourself into a hole. Uh, what's the second part? Is the data request. Eh? Processes. 
Usually people say have like, oh, I have a data science project. I think it always says like, why are you when doing this? What is your current way of doing this? And do you have any reference that I can read? I think these three kind of have like a good mix of vagueness and specificity. But it's up to your business law uh, at the end of the day. But these three things is something that I feel like is quite helpful. Um, yeah, so next question. Yes. I would like to know what is the technology steps you use in your organization. Talk to me personally. No, <laughs> no I mean, I know oh, that sorry? you're working with huh? uh, other agencies. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between you are working in on-prem infrastructure versus us working on, on private sector? Whereby we have the experience, mm. whereby we have the, the flexibility of using a lot of open source uh, technology stacks. Mm. What's your insight on this? Oh, loaded question. Oh. Can we like close the camera or something? Oh, okay, sorry. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Data breaches for institutions are bad. That's the worst case scenario that could happen. Now, with that in mind, you need to make sure whatever you do is secure safe and work really closely with IT what can I do what can I not do can I use this in an environment without internet connection but to have that stance you have to be confident that yes with this I am 99% sure it'll be okay but but work with IT because and all ITs are different. If you want to know more, talk to me personally. Okay. Like, Honestly, I do not know much about this. I'm so sorry. I think this is way beyond my pay grade. Aku macha je lah sebenarnya. Sorry lah, but, I, but uh, I mean, it's, it's real. I, I honestly do not know what's happening with other public agencies. Um, I know what's happening in my team and what happened between my team and IT. And Mm. I think we need to talk after this. Yes. Uh, but yeah, do do find me after this. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Good luck. Good luck. This is for the stream. This one is not just this one. Yep, that's the one. Okay, this is this one? Yep. Can this start? Yep, go. Yep. So next up we have Minton with uh, Data Engineering 101. Um, background, background, team structure, and skill set. Yeah, please give it up for me. Hi, guys. Uh, welcome to the technical talk of the Data Council talk series. Okay, so um, my name is Ming Xin, and I work for Money Lion. So before I start um, on anything, let me just um, have a brief introduction of myself. So Money Lion is a company I work for. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. Um, it is a digital bank based in America. 
Yeah. So Money Lion offers a wide range of services like personal finance, loans, saving accounts, investments. Um, it's a virtual bank, so all of this um, is done through a mobile app. And our mission is actually to build America's most complete and powerful financial membership. Okay. So myself, I have joined Money Lion 10 months ago, so not, not very long ago. Um, so as a, as a fintech company that drives all these um, financial services, of course the data that we <coughs> process every day is very critical, all the transaction data, the investment data. So um, when I joined Money Lion, I was, um, it was in the scaling stages. So when I joined, I was the third data engineer. And then 10 months later, now we have 10 data engineers. Yeah. So things have changed a lot since then, and I'll be sharing more on um, this process. So the agenda for today, first I'll give a brief overview on what's data engineering, and then how has the role of data engineer evolved over the years, and then what makes a data engineering team, and then how we do it in Money Lion. Okay, so first, the goal is simple, data engineering. We have some data source. We do processing over it. And then it is used to drive some business dashboards reports um, for ana analytical purposes, right? This is the essence of data engineering. Then what about in data science? So now people see that data is so valuable, they want to get um, insights from the data of the of organization. What about in data science? So there's actually this uh, really nice pyramid that I like. It's called the data science hierarchy of needs. So a lot of the time, the focus is always on the top level, right? AI, deep learning. But then in the data science hierarchy of needs, um, it actually explains that to achieve that, organizations actually have to go through all the foundational layers, right? From the bottom to the top. So first of all, of course, you will need to be able to collect your data, right? If you cannot collect data, and then where's what, what, what data, right? So the next step, after collecting data, you need to be able to move and store your data. So for example, if your application runs in US and your data science team runs in Malaysia, how are they able to analyze the data, right? So you have to store the data and move it to the people that need it. And then after that, finally your data is in place, then only you can perform like exploration and transformation over the data. This is the, the process where you clean the data, you wrangle with the data and stuff. And then finally, your data is clean and sparkling clean. Then your data science team can start to work on it, right? They can aggregate and do analysis. They can label it to prepare it for the next step, which is to build machine learning models. And then this is where they do some experimentations and finally, when you have all these foundations ready, you are ready for AI and deep learning. Yeah. So, data engineering encapsulates the bottom three parts, collect, move, store, explore, and transform. So, who is the data engineer? So, these are some of the keywords that people um, relate with the data engineer. They are one person that does all the ETL jobs, they wrangle with data, they build the data pipelines, they manage the data warehouse, right? But who are we? So I like to have this uh, very simple um, an analogy. So you can relate data engineer as a digital plumber. So imagine you have hired a team of plumbers to build a water storage system in a neighborhood, right? So you need to have your water storage system to, to um, deliver clean water to each of the houses. So what do you need? First, you need a water tank, which in our case is a database to store the data. You need to have taps, right? But in our case, it's a connection to the visualization tool, right? To allow the analyst to use the data. You will need to have pipes to move the data around the company. In our case, which is a custom ETL scripts to like uh, move data from one point to another. You need to have a reservoir to store large amount of water. In our case, that's the data warehouse. And then this is a filtration system to clean the water. In our case, it's a data wrangling process to wrangle data. And then also, sometimes you need pumps to make the water flow faster. In our case, it's 
multiprocessing or like a spark cluster to make jobs done faster. Right. So this is actually exactly how I explain my job to my dad and he gets it. So I find it's a very nice analogy. So this is a formal definition of who is a data engineer. So a data engineer is someone who has specialized their skills in creating software solutions around data. Yeah. So data engineer is a job that has been around for a long, long time. Like databases has been invented in the 1960s and people have been running their dashboards and reports all this while, right? So what's the change? So the first thing is that ETL is changing. So ETL stands for Extract, Transform, Load. Um, it's a very common um, job that um, relates to a data engineer's job. So why is it changing? In the past, most of the data is in relational form. Relational means like table forms, right? Structured data. But now, you have unstructured data. You have raw text articles, you have logs, you have um, video clips, pictures, voice clips, all kinds of IoT sensor data, right? So in fact, um, based on the Gartner study, 80% of the data we have today is unstructured data. As such, in the past, uh, most of the ETLs are done using ERP tools, like drag and drop ERP tools like Oracle, uh, SAP, SAS, and all. But then now, um, we tend to move towards um, more programmatic approach like Python scripts, Scala, and some of the workflow management tools like Airflow, Uzi. So the tools that we use has changed. And also in the past, data is small, <coughs> and now data is big. Yeah. I mean, uh, so small, big, right? What's the fuss? But actually, it's quite a big fuss. So in a small setup, you have like one server do one thing, right? You store data in one place, you analyze data in one place, you manage your workflow in one place. But in the big data, big data means that no lo um, one server no longer can store all your data. And you need to have distributed system. And then you will have more clusters and more things to process. So imagine last time you can run 10 process on one machine, now you have to run 100 processes on 10 machines. So the complexity is 10x. And also, the next thing is that um, data engineers, our roles always uh, revolve around data warehouse management. Um, in the past, we, um, or actually some in a lot of small businesses or traditional businesses, um, the, the trend is to use the on-prem data warehouse. So on-prem meaning that you actually need to have a physical data warehouse, whether you rent a space in the data center, or you have your office as the place to set up your servers. So you actually have to like physically go and buy the servers, install them, plug into the power supply, manage the cooling system, manage the networking, everything. But now, um, we tend to go towards cloud um, data warehouse. So all of this maintenance job is like offloaded to the cloud service providers like Amazon and um, Google Cloud Platform and stuff. And on top of that, we use more kinds of different data storage systems, right? We have Hadoop cluster, we have um, Amazon's S3 bucket, and we even have Data Lake, which is like a unified um, data platform with a different kind of storage engine sitting beneath it. So this is what the setup has turned out to be like for today. You have all kinds of data sources coming from all kinds of third-party services, different databases, different sensors, right? And then you do your batch processing or even stream processing using a number of tools. You store it on various places and then finally you use it to power um, dashboards. And sometimes also to um, drive the machine learning um, work in the data science. So what does it mean for us? It means that data engineers have to be master of tools. You have to learn all this do I know all this? No, I don't know all this. So what does this mean for us? It means that we actually need a data engineering team because it's just impossible for one person to know, know all that shit. Right? So what makes a data engineering team? A data engineering team is a multidisciplinary team 
and they are actually programmers who have cross-trained in other fields. So um, a lot of this section I actually take from a book called The Data Entry Teams Book by Jess Anderson. It's a, quite a good book if you want to uh, think about how to build big data teams. So these are the skills that he lists for um, that's required to build a data engineering team. So rather than just like software skills or data warehouse skills, data engineering team need to have like distributed system skills, um, programming, analysis, visual communication, verbal communication, project veterans, schema, and domain knowledge. So he actually um, also explains that when you want to set up a team, it's good to first do a skill gap analysis on the people that you hire. So like ex just list out all your members in the team and put, it, put all it in a column and then you just check what is missing in the team, right? The, the more of this that you have, then you have a higher success, success rate on um, carrying out a big project, a big data project. So finally, in Money Lion, um, what do we do, right? So when I join, it's pretty much this, like a lot of uh, data engineers, that the most conventional data engineers, which is ETLs and also data warehouse management, right? But then when I joined Money Lion, it was in the scaling stages. And then of course, uh, our data grows exponentially. And then we start to hit performance <coughs> issues. We start to hit, um, like we can't track where the data, the data lineage from. And then um, we find that some data are actually stored in the wrong format, in wrong places. So there are problems like this. So eventually, um, we, we find that since that our team is the nearest to the data, it's natural for us to build the skills around all these data tools. So we move out from just data warehouse management and start to learn about the other data technologies, like database, the, the different database, like data modeling, and how do we do performance tuning. And then we find that we have found ourselves a different role, like to fill the gap between, um, the, um, the, fill the gap of the product team. So we found that a lot of the times the product engineering team, their focus is more on the software, more on the code side. Database is often one of the most neglected component. And when they write data to a database, they often don't uh, consider how other people or other products will actually consume that data. So we find that we are in a position to fill that gap, and then we take up roles to be like data consultants and like data custodians. So in fact, in this, um, this approach, Money Lion has also started to integrate some of our data engineer members into the product team. So um, this is to allow the data engineers to be able to work hand in hand with the product team in the early stages of the data modeling process. And then of course, you also start to build skills around building our own data infrastructure. When you have multiple databases, then we have to be able to monitor that. And then we need to start to be able to manage the scripts that connects all of that. So we build our own data infrastructure and also monitoring infrastructure. So this is the setup of um, Moneyline Data Engineering Team. Um, this is actually quite out of date, uh, it's from June. But what I want to try to point out here is that, like the roles that I mentioned previously, it's not something that we just decide to do, like I want to be data custodian or something. It's more that as we work with data, we found out a lot of the pain points of the company, and then we work on that as OKRs. And as we work on the OKRs, we, uh, meaning objective key results, so we set goals and we, we achieve them using key results, we find ourselves to be slow, to, to slowly uh, specialize in certain things, and that's how we build our focus and work on more diverse stuff. So um, also in the book of data engineering teams, he actually described the data engineering team as the hub of the wheel of the company. So being the hub of, of the wheel, meaning that the team needs to know all the data pipelines of the company, needs to be able to, com to communicate the data from one product to another, like to store in what format, to, know, to allow the people to know what data is actually available for them to use. Yeah. So a lot of the times um, when organizations, they start a data project, 
they often don't realize that data is not a static thing. It will always often just grows. And when it grows, then you will start um, hitting scalable, scalability issues. Right? And then, of course, we also work very closely with the data science team. And together, this is how we um, connect with the rest of the organization. Yeah. So hopefully, we didn't doze off. But um, if nothing else, I hope you take away from the summary. So data is getting ever more complex. And hence, data engineers now have evolved in their responsibilities. And then bigger and more varied data introduces a new set of problems. And the solution of that is to have a multidisciplinary data team. Right? Therefore, the data engineer team is actually the crucial part of the hub of the view or of any data-driven organization. So, the aspiration of every data engineer is this. It is to deliver the data you need in a timely, efficient, and accurate manner. Thank you. Um, questions? Yeah, this is the reference page. Any questions? Yeah. Right. So now um, a lot of uh, company right they will have on prem and uh, on cloud uh, setup. So <coughs> there's what well, how you how you going to bridge this uh, in, in, in this hybrid uh, kind of architecture? Uh, what 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 kind of uh, pipeline that you use to bridge the gap? Okay. Um, so disclaimer. Fortunately for me, I've never dealt with on-prem database before. <laughs> but um, from what I read online, so it's actually quite hard to move the data from on-prem to the cloud, and it's also quite hard to scale on-prem. So if you have a lot of the resources, always working on maintaining on the operation sites of the data warehouse, you will never have resources, if you have resources to build scalable products. So the whole point of the cloud um, data warehouse is that you can offload this responsibility to the ones that does this better, right? Like Amazon and Google, so that you can focus on the more um, meaningful stuff. I guess, yeah. Uh, hi. hi. Sorry, man. Okay. Uh, can you describe uh, how the sprint cycle works uh, for your team at Mainland? Um, I can only speak for the data engineering team. Yeah. So for us, um, we have like always two sides of things. One is the business as usual part, which is we always still need to do DTLs. We still need to um, build like alerts and watcher scripts. Then that part, we handle it in the sprint. And on, on the other hand, we have OKRs to achieve. So those are more like research or project based. So those kind, um, we, because it's set as an OKR, it's tied to our own ownership. So we actually own that project and we sort of like um, roll with that. And yeah, we don't strictly follow screens for that, but we, we own that project and carry out the required tasks. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jeffrey here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, because today we are very honored to have two speakers. One coming from the regulators, which is highly regulated. Another one is a B2P uh, uh, bank, it's not, it's not digital bank. It's a digital bank. It's a digital bank. So, yeah. yeah. So, how, as a data engineer, I understand, I mean, the way you do, uh, if I use like, in, in, like in the cloud, uh, how do you see yourself fitting into a regulated banking environment? That's very hard. Yeah, I mean, this is some question that some of us might want to find out, right? I mean, yeah, so the things that you learn in money buying, that's great. But have you ever thought about moving this into a 
to be amical and show back environment. What, what kind of hurdles, what kind of challenges? I imagine there will be tons and tons of hurdles, and I think Nas will actually be able to answer that better than me. <laughs> 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 but I'll, I'll take this one, it's fine. <laughs> um, I think that a lot of the stuff that's being done on startup just can never be done on a, a traditional bank because, because of all the regulations, right? But um, they can, they was, if they want to, they can't scale indefinitely, right? Because, I, I mean, they, was, they, they would still have to hit scalable issues at one point. It's, it's going to be very expensive for them to, to move out of the ERP systems. <laughs> so, if you are offered a position in the bank, what is your solution? <laughs> um, I will reconsider the offer. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the, the skill sets is just completely different. So it's it's not the attack stack that I will look for. I, I, I will go for. Yeah. So you have to find a job. <laughs> <laughs> Until they have evolved, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So actually I have a question about scaling. Uh, earlier you were talking about how money like when when you joined it was still like a scaling phase, right? So uh, there were two growth stakers, like two data engineers, and then like eight months or ten months later you guys had ten. Ten. Yeah. So how did that process actually happen so quickly? Right? Did you guys like take in people and then train them or how is the I guess hiring process in Malaysia? Is it hard to find data engineers around? Yes. A lot of the initial hires like me and my colleague that joined as the, around the same time as me, we don't have data engineering background. So even actually my colleague is from um, <laughs> um, insurance background. So yeah. Uh, um, so of course we have to learn on the job. It's really hard to get data engineers, like a modern data engineer. And um, also we, we got a director from, uh, from our product team. So he has 10 years of software engineer skills. So that helped a lot. And also we have some people from infra, in, infra skills, some people from fresh grad, so that's a mix. Uh. So that's the whole point of the diverse team. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Uh, so you talking about your experience with the team. Uh, what can you share with uh, software engineers uh, what, what do not uh, software engineers that uh, don't think too much about database? What are the top three things that you know a young engineers should uh, learn? <laughs> First thing of my mind today, I'm dealing with an ETL with very many many nested fields, <laughs> so don't nest your fields too deeply in your <laughs> no SQL documents. Yeah, um, yeah, that's one. And um, the other one, use the right tool for the right job. I know it's really hard, but Try to understand what database are you using, and and after understanding that, you will realize that storing that kind of data in that kind of database completely doesn't make sense. And um, what else? Um, um, I guess actually we we also have a lot to learn from the software engineering team um, because actually they have better software programming skills and. I think some of them actually already are designing data, data intensive applications. So I think that part you can learn from them. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so we are down to the final session of tonight. 
the job pitch. Anybody hiring? You have a few sec like 30 seconds, a minute. I give you all the mic. Actually, I'm the head of uh, data engineering in the Devil World Digital. So, <laughs> so uh, if you guys read or pull out or case, I know who you are. <laughs> no, uh, basically, my team is expanding. We are looking for two or three good, handsome, pretty. No, <laughs> so, we are, we are looking for team members in data engineering and data science as well. So, if you guys have what it takes to work with handsome boss. <laughs> Uh, so come, uh, send resume to hafiz.nazri at mediaprima.com.my And also I run Data Science Malaysia uh, group, Facebook group That's where we can argue, uh, hate each other, love each other So come join the Facebook group, just search Data Science Malaysia And I will post my email or anything there Right, thanks Hi, uh, very good evening. I'm Jeffrey here from Nimos Perhat. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mark, we are here to uh, witness the first conference from Data Council. Give a big round of applause to Data Council. Wow. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity to do a job pitch. Okay, Nimos Perhat is a research and development ICT uh, center reporting the Ministry of International Trade Industry. Now, someone asked about stakeholder management. If you okay, if you like to learn about stakeholder analysis, how you manage different variety of stakeholders, come to Mimos. We are very much similar to Bank Gara <laughs> because because we we provide services to many uh, departments from the ministry level, from tourism, international trade to ministry. So we meet all the different people, right, from the Java time. So we are hiring promising young, experienced data engineers and data scientists. We need you guys to be there. <laughs> because Nemo's had enough of old people like myself. We need young blood to come in and to help the ministries to resolve some of the projects, some of the big issues. And uh, I mean, today, almost all the ministries, all the government departments are trying to change in terms of their process, in terms of their IT platform. So we need uh, data engineers and data scientists. So if you are interested to find out more, please come to me find out more and definitely I will be so happy to meet you and help you to submit your resume. Thank you very much. Huh? Okay, but well the fun part is you don't have to be a PhD but you will work like one. <laughs> because one thing special about Mimos is not only that you must do the work, you must do research and publication because we have our KPI has uh, patent publication, you need to publish patents, you need to write publication, you need to give conference talk, and you need, you need to do some research. So it's a combination of all. So you will work like a PhD scholar. Okay, thank you. We'll have uh, two more, two more out of the way. Uh, hi guys, I'm Hazik, I'm the other organizer that hasn't really seen very much. I'm actually from an advertising group, publicist group, if you have heard of it, hopefully not. Anyways, uh, I'm from Digitas, the digital wing of the publicist group. So we're ready to hire analysts and engineers to work on projects for our clients as well. So typically our projects for helping making their marketing data pipeline work properly and helping clients who have a lot of marketing data actually make use of it. So that's our angle and then we then use the data for our own internal purposes for advertising because it's the whole process. We do marketing, communication, data, and creative. So if you're interested, come talk to me after this and I'll give you my email. Thanks a lot, guys.
final one. Okay, over there. Hi guys, uh, I'm from uh, company called HelloGo. Uh, our data team is very, very new. Uh, our engineering team has a grand total of one person. So uh, I don't actually have any comments, but if you want to come, I'll fight for you. Uh, so if you're a student, a recent graduate, or someone who's sick of his corporate job at PK here, and then he joins company, then uh, he left uh, to join my life. So if you want to do something in between and you want to have a no strings attached relationship, uh, let us know and you can help us to further our engineering capabilities. Thank you. Unfortunately, we take a little bit of how uh, many people work. Because a lot of people are hiring. <laughs> including Faith. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we've come so we've come to the end of tonight's session. I really want to thank all of you for attending. Uh, if you want to keep up with uh, our future meetups, we're looking for a lot of uh, we're looking at a lot of companies to go and have our meetups at. Some of them being Money Lion, REA, Seek Asia, a lot of them coming up. If you guys have uh, ideas or uh, want to suggest some speakers you want to see, you can talk to uh, any one of us. Yeah, so again, feedback would be highly appreciated. Uh, thank you, yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, before, you leave, before you leave, can we have one picture over there?